Text 51551, The Ray Darcy Show on RTE Radio 1. Uh, 51551. Now, in studio, we're joined by Donegal man Killian McLaughlin. And uh, Killian runs Wild Ireland, which is a wildlife sanctuary. Um, and he is the subject, and so too is the wildlife park, of a new RT1 programme, uh, which starts tonight at 8.30, called Return of the Wild, the Bear Man of Buncrana. <laughs> The Bearman of Buncrana, Killian. Anyway. The, 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 the TV people give you that name. Or? They did indeed, yeah. Yes. I think it might have been coined uh, in a newspaper some time ago as well, but it's a, it's a great name. It's it is. very catchy. Yeah. Thanks for coming down. A uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah. And I, I watched the episode that's gone out tonight. And uh, it, what, what, what fascinates me is that I had no idea that such a place existed. Yes. Um, and it's been an odd time, I suppose, with COVID and everything. Um, yeah. but, but you... Your life story is fascinating as well. And this is the culmination of you know, a lifetime's interest and in work. Absolutely. So, yeah, so bring yeah. us back to the start. We all loved animals as kids, but you had a particular interest. Exactly, Ray. That's something that I always say. I think we're all born with a fascination for wildlife and the natural world. It's whether or not we retain that or, or whether or not that's been nurtured. Um, I think it should be nurtured in schools and I think kids should be educated about the natural world, particularly the natural world that we have here in Ireland. Very often we focus on the subject of wildlife documentaries in Africa or Asia and with all the big impressive animals. But little do many people know that we had all these big and impressive animals right here in Ireland just a few thousand years ago that were unfortunately hunted to extinction. And I never learned about that in school. And I think that I I wish I had have been and I wish I learned about temperate rainforests and everything else. But, you know, it's not part of the curriculum. I think I was lucky in that I, I was born into a family that recognised my interest in, in wildlife and encouraged me and nurtured that interest. And yeah. Uh, maybe so what was the first animal you had? The then? very first animal I ever had, well, we had a family dog, but my own first pet was a, a hamster called Ben. <laughs> and that's where it all started. I think I was about five or six years of age. And really, that's where it grew from there. Uh, and the other way, Dr. Doolittle and all that, there's always stories about these figures who have a special affinity to yes. animals. Yes. Um, is that, that you? I think I think some people are born with a, with a gift. And um, the, the more you... Sp- the more time you spend around animals, they will they will educate you. Um, you know, if you do something silly, you're going to get bitten. You know, and, and that's because they're wild, exactly. <laughs> and you're going to get an education, and you learn how to behave around them. You learn uh, social distance, and every animal has has a an acceptable space between you and them that they'll allow you to get into. The wilder they are, the, the larger that space will be between you and the animal. And you learn all that. The more you spend around them, the more comfortable you become with them, and they become with you. Uh-huh. And how did you develop then a name in the locality for a, a sort of a, a haven, a sanctuary for rescue animals? How sure. did that come about? So, I mean, um, I had a very understanding mother for a start uh, <laughs> that allowed me to take all these animals into the house and look after them. And I think once you have that... Um, but there must have been... Was there a first one? Was there a... Uh, well, Jack, Jack the Jackdaw. The, he was Jack a, the Jackdaw. <laughs> a, crow, a crow called Jack. Um he, I, I, I actually hand reared him. He'd fallen out of a nest, and I hand reared him whilst I was doing my junior cert. So, like, like any other baby, they need fed every two hours. So I was counting down the hours to the end of the exam to get home and feed the bird <laughs> instead right. of going home to study for the next exam. So it, I lived quite close to the school. And then the, the, the funny thing is that the bird then used to follow me to school. And I think most uh, <laughs> people of a certain generation in Bunkrana will remember Jack. Uh, when I went off to university, then poor Jack didn't know where I had gone. So he used to go to the school every day looking for me. Oh, poor Jack. He knew where my maths teacher's window was and he'd often go up and peck on the window looking for me but then he got then he got to know that I would be home on the bus at four or five o'clock and he would wait down at the bus and, and follow me home so he was, he was quite the character he ended up then on, on Nationwide of course because he could speak and people were shocked that a, that a crow could say a few words they're very good mimics like parrots um, So that, what, what did he say? Hello and uh I think he used to say various other words that maybe I can't repeat on the radio that he learned <laughs> right, that he learned yeah. up around the school. But he was a character. He really was. Yeah. And he would steal people's lunches. And I remember my old principal ringing me one morning and saying that I had to come and take the bird home because he was stealing people's lunches. And I remember my principal saying to me, "Tell him if he has if, if tell him if he wants to come to school, he must wear a uniform." <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack started and then you got a name locally. Yeah, I think I had the name before that. You know, Jack was brought to me and then various other foxes and otters and uh, all sorts of things. And then eventually 
you know, I had snakes as well. I always had a fascination with reptiles. Um, and I had I had a snake that belonged to a drug dealer, believe it or not, that actually ended up in jail and nobody would take this big Burmese python. She was, oh, yeah, the, the, the drug dealer ended up in jail, not yeah, the snake. Yeah, not yeah. the snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nobody else wanted her. So I, I ended up taking her. Uh, somebody phoned me one day and said they had a pet monkey. And they had, with work, they were being moved to New Zealand. Uh, and they couldn't take the monkey with them and that was Susie and Susie's still with me today she's about 30 years of age so she's nearly as old as I am um, and she's she's old and she's uh, got a bent so over so all of these were out in the back garden yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 and then and, and you like the schools got to know about well, it and they, they, can't, they can't punish you retrospectively so but you, you, you're probably you know contravening health and safety and all sorts of things. No, or, not really. No. no, no, no. Ireland's an incredible place where you, you need a license to keep a dog, but you don't need a license to keep a tiger in your back garden, believe it or not. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I never had any tigers in my back garden, but, you know. But you had a monkey. And a, I, I had four of them, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the garden. Yeah, from various backgrounds, That's you know. A, and they weren't, that, that, they weren't that, pets. I don't want to come across that these were pets. No. Uh, like one of the monkeys I had, uh, or still have um, used to wear a nappy and they, they knitted clothes for him and things like that and, he, and it was horrible you know and the first thing I did was cut them off him yes. and put him with a, with a, with a I, social group at, at this point I, I should make it clear that you went on to study zoology Correct, yeah, at, yeah, at, at yeah, third yeah, level yeah, and, and yeah. you are a conservationist oh absolutely yes, at heart yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that you and sort of uh, Joe Exotic are worlds apart absolutely um, yeah. you know it's funny, I, I joked with my sister this morning, she's a fashion blogger, the sequin Cinderella, and she would wear a lot, an awful lot of leopard print. And I said to her, because people do draw that comparison with Joe Exotic, and I said to her, if, if I'm Joe Exotic and you're Carl Baskin wearing all your leopard print. But <laughs> no, look, Joe Exotic, I mean, the human side of that story is tragic in itself, but yes. the animal side is even more tragic, if you ask me. Imagine feeding lions and tigers from uh, processed meat r- salvaged from a dumpster. I mean, that is crazy. Mm -hmm. He claimed to be a sanctuary, but he was breeding cats for profit so that people could come and take their photograph. And, you know, that doesn't just go on in America. That goes on here in Europe as well. And in Europe, uh, we don't have that breeding big cats and going and getting your photograph taken with them. But but we do have a big problem with brown bears in this continent. And that's where you got your, you know, the bear man of Buncrana because... Yep. You have three brown bears. We have three brown bears at Wild Ireland, yes. In Wild Ireland, yes. yes. And tell us their story. So the three brown bears uh, started out life in a museum in Lithuania that's dedicated to Stalin and the Iron Curtain and all this kind of stuff. Um, and and bears, what's the connection there? Go on. I think bears are a symbol of Russian power okay. or whatever. And uh, this guy wanted them as an extra tourist attraction just to bring people through the door. So we had six bears, Ray, in a very small concrete cage cell, like a jail cell with iron bars, concrete caked in feces. And these six bears spent their whole life in that. They never had the opportunity to run or play or swim or do any of those things that bears might do in the wild. Um, There's a charity called Bears in Mind that uh, are excellent and they rescue bears from all around the world. And they rescued the bears and they brought them to a place in Belgium called Nature Help Centrum. And then they outsourced them then or outplaced them to their final uh, new home uh, at Wild Ireland where they could live a very natural life. Uh, When they arrive, like our big male, Donica, is 450kg. I would say coming up to the winter now, he's he's probably topped the scales over the 450. And he's big and he's impressive and you would be really afraid of him if you you met him. What what height is he when he goes up on his high legs? He's he's over three metres tall when he stands up. up So so near 10 foot tall. Absolutely, maybe even taller. Um, When I opened the, the... the sliding gate to let him out, Ray, of the holding pen. He, he put his foot out onto the grass, and I'll never forget it. This is a big, powerful animal. He put his foot out onto the grass, and he lifted it off because it moved under his feet. And he had never experienced grass or soil under his feet. And a big when you see a big animal like that afraid of grass, it really hits you right in the throat. Yeah. Um, and it took him a long time to come out and wander around and his two sisters were with him. The sad thing was, Ray, that they couldn't confiscate the other three bears because he had paperwork for them. It, my bears were only confiscated because he didn't have the correct paperwork for them. So the rest of their extended family the are still... three bears were left behind and right. one has since died, presumably okay. of neglect. But those other two bears are there uh, in horrible conditions. But now, thankfully, now, my bears are... There's a scene in tonight's programme where you go to the uh, Natural History Museum yeah. and you meet that amazing man who we've had on the show on numerous occasions, Nigel Monaghan. Yes. And he fills you in on the animals that are, would have roamed Ireland yes. back in the day. And brown bear were one of the species. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they have evidence there in the, the, the museum to prove that. They do indeed. Uh, I got to hold fossils of Irish brown bears. And I tell you, 
you know, if, if an object could speak, you know, when you hold that fossil in your hand, you can feel the history. And this is a brown bear that roamed Ireland, fished salmon in our rivers, ate blackberries. And, you know, it's, it's really quite incredible. Um, and then Nigel showed me a wolf jaw as well, an Irish wolf, which I got to hold. And that would have been hunting deer right here in Ireland. And he even showed me, this is all in the documentary, he, he let me hold a little tiny bear jaw that was only a couple of weeks old. Bears give birth underground in the wintertime when they're hibernating and this little cub was born underground and he never saw the light of day. He, uh-huh. he died in the cave uh, 3,000 years ago and archaeologists upturned this little jawbone. Um, he's, he's, he's actually the, probably the last of his kind or coming up close to now the why end. Why did they become extinct in Ireland? You see, this is the thing. It's very difficult to say when, when they went extinct or why they went extinct. We know that there was big land clearings for agricultural purposes certainly uh, humans arrived in Ireland about 12 and a half thousand years ago um, it was believed that they arrived 10,000 years ago until they found a bear fossil that had cut marks which had been made by human tools and when they dated that bone it was 12 and a half thousand years ago so that pushed human arrival way back and then when you, you take that 12 and, a th- 12 and a half thousand years and you look at the youngest bone that they found 3,000 years that's 9,000 years or 9,500 years that humans shared this island with bears yeah. and that, that's, that's amazing um, and then <laughs> wolves right up yeah. until less than 300 years ago when they were hunted to extinction and the last wolf died in uh, uh, 1786 yeah. in so, County Carlow. So your brown bears, they, it's, you don't have to heat them or anything like that. This is the perfect climate Perfectly for them. Perfectly adapted to the climate. And the woodlands and all that is perfect for them. Absolutely. So Dunica, he goes to put his foot in the grass and recoils. Recoils back onto the concrete. How was it? That, that's how many? 18 months ago? or uh, Just, just, no? just on just under a year, year ago. A year right. in October. Uh, how yeah. was he now getting oh, used to it? Right. What he did then, this is heart wrenching. If you had a seen it, he, he, he pulled the he pulled the soil up onto the up onto the, the concrete and he stood on it there first to make sure it was walk, walk, safe to walk on and then he wandered out. And it's taken the bears nearly a full year to learn how to swim. Um, and that's amazing because bears need to swim and, and hunt. Wild, sand. It's yes. one of the reasons that these bears can't go back to the wild uh, because they couldn't survive they couldn't swim they wouldn't know how to catch fish uh, so two of our bears now swim uh, one of them is going still into wearing, the still into wearing the, armbands yeah exactly exactly um, she took I tell you it was a proud day when, when they took off their armbands and went they, for they a swim they didn't yeah, have yeah. armbands no of course they didn't but, <laughs> <laughs> but one, of them, one of them will go in now and, and keep her feet on the on the floor and sit down on a warm day so I'm hoping she'll, she'll yeah. take off the armbands very soon and go for a swim so you know, it, so it what was, else? You've 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 bears, you've wolves, we've a pack you've of deer. wolves. Yeah, there's deer. Um, there's a lynx as well. I always say the the lynx is the original Celtic tiger. This is a big <laughs> yes. cat that we once had roam in this country. You probably seen that in the yes. in the clip yeah. this morning as well. Uh, Nisha, she's beautiful, and when you see her in in the natural forest, it's it's fantastic to see. Um, they went extinct a long time ago. Very difficult to say when exactly as well, because lynx don't sleep in caves like bears and wolves do. So when they die out in the open, their fossils or bones are washed away oh, before see, they get yes, a chance to yes. fossilize. Uh, so there was just one lynx that was unfortunate enough to fall into a cave and then the bones turned up there. And that's how we know that they, they were here. Uh, we have the wolves, we have the wild boar as well. And the wild boar gave birth over lockdown and the, the little borlets, as they're called, they look like uh, humbug sweets. They're brown with stripes. They went viral. They were all over the news in America yeah. and everywhere, which was really... I think people were looking for a good news story and the little wild borlets were, were, were exactly what people wanted. Uh, we've an otter, we've red foxes, uh, I have crane as well and crane are really interesting. And and some of them are in enclosures and then some of them are just wild around the place. Is that um, way, or are they no, all enclosures? Unfortunately, look, it would be lovely to, to open the gates and let them free but yes. for obvious reasons that can't happen. Um, I have built the enclosures as large as I can to take in uh, taking into account as much of the natural habitat as possible. Uh, they live in the forest, but they are behind fences. Okay. They are behind fences, okay. and, and, is, and that's an is, unfortunate this thing. This is a labour of love for you. Oh, absolutely! It's a lifelong passion, uh, and, and people will see tonight. They, you did law after zoology, went to England, uh, uh, practice over there. No right. practice here in Ireland. Oh, you practice here. In, in Sorry, you came back. And you, Kelly Kelly you met Katie. Yeah. You met Katie where? in Dublin. Yeah, in Dublin. Dublin. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. Katie's a dub. And she's law as well. She's a solicitor as well. And right. she moved up to Donegal and she started to work in the family practice in, in Bunkrana. 
Um, and then we were and doing this. You share a love of animals. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which it, it wouldn't have lasted if she didn't love I animals. I don't as think much so. No, I remember my mother saying to me when I was a young fella, "You'll never get a woman to, to to put up with what I have to put up with." So I was really lucky that Katie was one that that puts up with the. the I mean, and when had, did you get married? We got married in December two thousand and eighteen. Right. Which okay. Is, uh, under and two years ago. While you were putting the whole thing together, um, you were doing up a house as well, and people would see that. Yeah. As well as. Me thinking about uh, Tiger King when uh, I saw the thing last night. I also thought of uh, The Durrells, which yes. we watched. Yes. Uh, and that's based on a book by Gerald Durrell. And you reminded me of him. Yes. You, you know of him? I do. I do. Gerald Durrell is one of my heroes. Oh, um, right. He, he inspired so many conservationists. He unfortunately passed away in 1995. Um, but Tell his, people about him. Yeah, so he, he, he was an author and uh, he, he had a love of conser- conservation and conserving the animals that people maybe didn't get so excited about. So the little brown animals that he used to call them are, you know, the ones that they weren't the big impressive lions and tigers and everything else. And he set up the Dural Conservation Trust in Jersey and they have that trust and that wildlife park in Jersey have saved so many species from extinction through captive breeding and reintroduction. The Mauritius kestrel springs to mind, the pink pigeon and various other animals that are forgotten about. Madagascar was another place that he concentrated on. Maybe the lemurs, the, the ringtail lemurs that everybody loves and the, the cartoons are made about, but the, the eye eye is another lemur species that's quite ugly. They used to call it the witch's cat right. uh, in Madagascar. Um, but he, he started a breeding program for them and saved so many species from extinction and um, his books are just brilliant and, and he inspired so many people to become conservations, conservationists and he certainly inspired me as well. And I hope I hope through this documentary as well that I can Show Inspire people others, yeah. what we've lost in this country. You know, the, the wolf and the bear and the lynx are very unlikely to come back unless we really change the landscape here in Ireland. And and did you contact him or? Yeah, so um, I was only 10 years old when he passed away, but his widow, Lee, Dr. Lee Durrell, she's still, um, she's still there running the trust. And my mother actually wrote to her when, we were, when I was quite young and she told her about my aspirations and she invited me over to the zoo and I got to go behind the scenes and see conservation firsthand and I keep in touch with her and I actually have a signed postcard signed by herself and Gerald uh, wishing me all the best uh, uh-huh. as a young boy and that's one of my most prized possessions yeah it's a lovely lovely little keepsake that I have uh-huh. uh, and I keep in touch with her and up to date on, on everything I, I can't so. wait to bring the family up to Wild Ireland oh you're more than welcome yeah. you're more than welcome and I think when you watch when you watch this documentary as well I mean Shane Brennan and Moondance and Pascal Cassidy the cameraman they became part of the family right they were there they were at the wedding our wedding uh, they were there when we, the day we found out that Katie was pregnant um, and they really like Shane took a, took a real risk because you know this could have fallen flat yes. in its face because you know there's so many challenges to overcome the, the finances the red tape the planning issues you can imagine uh, this, but uh, it's the, but your vision yeah. shines through the whole thing I've only seen the first episode but this is something you've been dreaming about from when you were arranging animals on the kitchen table at home correct when yeah. 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 When yeah. You're yeah. Under 10. when I was a little boy yeah this has just been my life's ambition and it's not complete yet you know this is just phase one and I like to say that the the animals are still living in puppy pens I've loads more space up there that I'd like to expand and let them roam through the forest and um yeah, the future, the future looks good. And, uh, you know, it wasn't set up to be a tourist attraction or anything like that. It was set up primarily as a wildlife sanctuary. And I, and I, and I wanted to educate people, but I, had, I was thinking locally, but there was something about bringing these animals back. And they were once in Ireland, bringing them back that has inspired so many. And I think uh, it's captured everybody's imagination yeah. as well that they're now back. Well, it's a great watch. Uh, Return of the Wild, the Bear Man of Bunkrana, who is Killian Midlockton. Killian, thanks so much for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you, Ray. Thank you. The Ray Darcy Show on RTE Radio 1. Uh, Gordon Mall, good Marion. Thank you very much. Five on five, five on radar t dot ie. Um, on Killian Midlockton there. I'm delighted to have Killian in studio. I was in his class in primary school in Donegal. He's amazing with animals and so generous with his time and very patient answering all my animal questions. Wild Ireland is such a great addition to Inishown. Looking forward to the programme. Says Jennifer and Kevin says Wild Ireland is fantastic. Well worth a visit. Well done and good luck to Killian. And where is Wild Ireland, says somebody else. And it's up in Burnfoot uh, on the Inishone Peninsula in County Donegal. And it's on the uh, Donegal Derry border. Um, and if you tune in tonight at 8.30, you'll see all that. OK, join the studio by psychologist.